Let's begin. Another week? Another busy week. <laughs> yes. When isn't it busy in Beijing? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All right, so uh, first, first things first, four leaders visited uh, within a very short period of time. Within four days, actually, five days. Within five days, but you know, interesting to me was mm -hmm. the geo, uh, uh, geographical coverage mm -hmm. that you had. So you, you had uh, Africa with Tanzania, mm -hmm. right? You have, of course, Germany, the EU, uh -huh. um, you had Pakistan, which represents Central South Asia. Asia, South Central Asia. That's right. And then uh, you also had Vietnam. Vietnam, which is ASEAN. That's right. So within one week, you basically had a huge swath of the world, uh, including Europe, which I thought was interesting. I think it's the first EU head of state to visit since three years ago. Well, since before COVID, obviously. Yeah, before no, COVID. No one's, no one's yeah. really been here. But let's just give everyone a short recap. I mean, the Vietnamese trip didn't generate a lot of headlines, but something very, very important happened. Very, very important. Uh, aside from agreements to collaborate on agriculture, on trade, on commerce, on protecting the supply chain, um, I think the most significant thing that happened was uh, the preliminary agreement for Vietnam to build a new high-speed rail with Chinese gauge. Chinese gauge. Which is European gauge. European gauge. Right. So now you have Europe and China that have always enjoyed the same railroad gauge. Russia does not. That's right. All right. And there's a history to that. There is a long history to that. We don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, um, you know, Russia, well, Russia did it because they didn't want German tanks rolling in to, to being able to use the rail. Russian rail. That's so right. that, that was the case. But in this case, it's not just the announcement. But if you had done this 10 years ago, the amount of time and resources necessary to change out a wooden tie, mm -hmm. all right, or to, to change concrete, out ties yeah. to a concrete tie or any tie would be enormous. Mm -hmm. You'd have to stop the rail. You'd have you know you know guys digging these physically things out, taking them out and then one at a time, them out yeah. and then shoving one back in, and yeah. then trying to make sure that's in alignment and everything like that. Mm -hmm. A tremendous scene. Now, I've actually seen a machine that is automated, and what it does, it replaces the con um, the the wooden, wooden tie. Yeah with a concrete tie. Why is that significant? Once you have a concrete tie that's perfectly aligned, you can speed up the rail yeah. quite significantly. Yeah. Uh, fast rail on yeah. long stretches, on mm -hmm. curved stretches, they can change because they're there. They can change the gradient so that they can create a much faster rail. So you'll be able to go from any part of China all the way down to um, Ho Chi Minh City. That's right. I, I think, uh, yes, absolutely. The, the infrastructure, the way Chinese can build the infrastructure is like no one else. Uh, politically, it's very significant because it means that Vietnam has agreed politically to be integrated into the Chinese supply chain for well, Southeast Asia. Which but it's is, not just China, it's yeah, European. Exactly. A global supply chain. That's right. European and also the ASEAN countries yeah. that goes beyond Vietnam to Thailand, to Cambodia, to Laos, to Miramar, and so on. Yeah. I think uh, uh, the announcement also that uh, Indonesia will showcase the soft opening of the high-speed rail in yes. Indonesia it's built by the, China Rail. Yeah, it's part, it's part, of part of the G20. Of G20. Yeah. Yeah. Showcase is a big word. So it, it is, especially since you have the leaders of the G20, who, <laughs> some of whom who will be gritting their teeth. That's right. <laughs> as uh, um, you know, the Chinese economic miracle is on display while yeah. they're sitting there. That's right. Yeah. I think the, the Vietnam case is particularly interesting also because for the last decade or so, U.S. has tried to get Vietnam to counter China's yes. progress. Uh, this doesn't seem proxy. to be countering it. It doesn't seem to be working, you're yeah. right. Okay, we have, we have three more countries to go. Yeah. All right, so Pakistan, it seemed uh, very clear that despite 
any domestic issues, mm -hmm. uh, politics, mm -hmm. that the uh, relationship with China continues to be strong. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I, I can't imagine any more superlatives being yeah. used, uh, you know, uh, uh -huh. iron you know, brotherhood yeah. and, uh, you know, higher than the highest mountain, deeper yeah, than the yeah, deepest yeah. sea, things yeah. like this. So I, I think it sends an international message that, you know, countries are not about administrations alone. Mm -hmm. That when administrations change, um, this idea that somehow the relationship between countries changes is not a good one. I think it's far better when countries express solidarity with each other's people, mm -hmm. that the goals are, are the same. Are so strategically I, I was, aligned, absolutely. Well, at least, yeah, strategically, but also there's a tremendous amount of goodwill which mm -hmm. you don't see with any other nation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the US, you know, is, I, they, they seem America first. It doesn't seem to be any real interest in anybody else's. And you, you rarely see this expression of deep friendship, mm -hmm. regardless of the administration. Because the administrations, other places, you know, you, if it's, the, the seesaw swings on this side and they're, if they have good relations with China, you can guarantee the next side that comes in is going to have poor relations with mm -hmm. China. But nothing's changed. In terms of also, in ter as, as you described, in terms of the human relationship, yeah. uh, the flooding in Pakistan, tens yeah. of millions by well, R&B uh, on, on a personal basis from local Chinese population, yeah. you know, be it 200 or 500. Or but the essence of our yeah. humanity is you know, this kind of compassion for That's each right. other. That's right. That's where trust yeah. comes from. Yeah. In a world where there's a lack of trust mm -hmm. and inability to deal with each other, mm -hmm. I, I think it's a real nice counterpoint to have uh, somebody saying, I don't care who your administration is, we have friendship, yeah. we have shared goals, yeah. we have stood by each other. Yeah. I mean, you know, if I have a neighbor, I don't want a neighbor who's transactional. I'm, well, I'll help you out if you have a fire if there's something in it for, for me. me. Yes. To use my fire brigade. <laughs> yeah, fire brigade. Uh, yeah, that's nice. Okay, so from Pakistan, let's go to Tanzania. Not a lot said about that. No. No. Except that, uh, um, okay, there is an interesting political history here. Uh, the Tanzanian Railroad, the first yes. railroad built in Africa, actually, major railroad was built by the Chinese as an economic support to Tanzania. And Tanzania was very, very close to China for a long time until the last six or seven years yeah. where there were attempts by the European powers, especially the UK and the US, to divide China yeah, I mean, and they, Tanzania. They always use this debt, uh, debt trap diplomacy. That's but right. On the other hand, when they were lending money to Tanzania and insisting that they change the government, yeah. That, yeah. that's somehow different yeah. than China saying, look, we're just doing projects. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you run your government the way you see yeah. fit. And in addition to that, in addition to the pressure that uh, the US and the Western countries put on Tanzania to move away from China, uh, there were some internal political battles within Tanzania. Yeah. So the relationship be between China and Tanzania um, was not as, as good as at its peak, but yeah, it's changing now, again. But again, but once again, it should be about people to people, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, one administration is pro-China, one administration mm -hmm. is against China. Nothing has changed mm -hmm. between administrations. It's just used as a political point to divide yeah, people. That's right. But why Tanzania all of a sudden decides to visit so, so quickly and in, a, in a such a strongly positive way? Because, because they found the promises from the West weren't delivered. Yeah, and you, you can see that with uh, climate change goals, right. uh, economic goals, everything. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're, we're still waiting for the framework <laughs> to the Biden administration has been talking about. Indo-Pacific uh, economic well, framework. Well, it's, it, I, no, he had a framework for Africa. We just won't know about it for mm. maybe well, ever, No, forever. <laughs> because he will be gone before anything is done. That's right. But it really, I think, so. okay, let's, let's get. Uh, Germany. Germany. That's a big Interesting. One.
27 billion dollars in deals. Yeah. Uh, airplanes. Yeah. Uh, the uh, BioNTech. That's right. Uh, the sale of the um, the anti uh, the viral uh, the vir I shouldn't the um, uh, what do you call it? the MR mRNA vaccine vaccines yeah to China. Yeah. Um, now you know people are trying to. They don't understand the full implications of this. If you, if you allow, and now this is only for expats in China mm -hmm. at the moment, but what it means is that there used to be a problem. If you had outside um, vaccines, mm -hmm. they weren't recognized in China. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the Chinese vaccines weren't recognized outside. <laughs> outside. So how do you get vaccinated to come to China if you don't have access to the Chinese vaccine mm -hmm. because they don't recognize the European or American vaccines? This is the door opening. Collaboration. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Well, it means that anyone coming from mm -hmm. uh, the West, if they've had those vaccines, mm -hmm. they can get into China. Yeah. And that's, that's a huge step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Maybe it should have been happened uh, sooner, but the geopolitics of it... Um, and coming to the geopolitics, his visit with 12 of the top companies' leaders from Germany. Talk about SOEs, <laughs> <laughs> state-owned enterprises. I Apparently, mean, uh, there were over 100 applicants from uh, major German companies that wanted sure. to join the trip. But Get on couldn't. that gravy train while it's still yeah. rolling. <laughs> yeah, but this is despite the internal conflict within Europe and within Germany. But I, I, isn't yeah. Germany just being realistic and saying, you know, it's not, it, we're not capable of being competitive mm -hmm. in manufacturing here. We're facing real difficulties uh, on a, you know, At person. Home with energy, yeah, of course. Energy, heat, food, yeah. uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. um, you have to get the economy restarted. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they've been they're still in surplus, although they've they've had a you know, net negative for a you're, while. You're absolutely right. You just have to be very realistic with what you're confronting, what you're dealing with. But unfortunately, uh, there are ideological drives mm -hmm. that started with the U.S. in terms of common values and so on, that led to many German politicians, including the foreign minister talking about we've been too naive about China, we have to uh, yeah, but disengage it, and so on and so forth. Yeah, but th those are the people who don't, I mean, Greens and other groups exactly. who aren't really interested in uh, reality. You know, the hard reality. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, they're looking at a different reality. Yeah. I mean, climate change is an issue, but relations with China are absolutely necessary mm -hmm. to On climate combat. change, yeah, exactly. And green energy, uh, renewables, you, know, you, you I, name I, it. I, the, the logic of it really defies my understanding. Uh, if you're green and you really think seriously about climate change and want to collaborate on a global basis, then you would not have participated actively on the sanctions against Russian well, you have Gas. to think them through. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. You can have one, but you can't have both. I can't That's have right. my cake and, and eat, eat it. it too. Yeah. Right. So I think uh, I'm still not very optimistic about many of the Europeans because the populists, you know, yeah. it's easy to shout, shout slogans about democracy and freedom. And but once sovereignty. they get into power, Mm. And they cannot deliver because nothing changes That's with right. administrations. Yeah. It's just simply a new group comes in, same old problems. I mean, like Great Britain. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's changed? Sunak is in, <clears throat> Truss is out, Boris is out. What has Big changed? Big deal. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's musical chairs. It's the, as I keep saying, it's the Titanic. And rather than rearranging the deck chairs, yeah. they're rearranging uh, the captain. Yeah. But you still hit... You know, you still, still hit over 10% inflation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not working. Okay, so let's talk about... Um, but immediately after this, mm -hmm. we have a whole bunch of things happening in terms of global collaboration, right? Mm -hmm. You have COP27 in Egypt. Yeah. You have... Uh, G20, G G20 coming up in Bali. And mm -hmm. uh, APEC has a state informal meeting. You have the ASEAN plus one. And you have, and then coming up next month, oh, a big of, one! A, well, a series 
Yeah, big series because of, of its sim symbolism. Symbolism. I mean, and what we're, t we're talking about this, um, yeah. the Gulf Cooperation Council, That's the right. Arab League. That's right. And the, the president of China's visit to Saudi Arabia. And yeah. the, the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia announced last week it will be reception of the highest standards ever. Yeah, Donald Trump means. will be watching carefully to see, <laughs> <laughs> to see if, if she gets a better reception than, than he, did. he did. But I think <clears throat> the meeting with uh, the Arab League is very significant as well. Uh, you know, Arab League with President Xi as a special participant, and then the Gulf Cooperation Council. Now, this is interesting. There's never been an American, an Arab League, where the American president was a special. That's member. right. Never. Now, in terms of GCC, Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, what's very significant here is potentially what this could lead to, to start with, is the free trade zone between yes. China and Gulf Cooperation Council. I'll but be interested then, to see if the terms are very similar to RCEP. Exactly. And perhaps this would be a preliminary to rolling it into That's RCEP. That's right, RCEP. And to have the Gulf countries become part of RCEP would, would be, be very, but very But this important. seems to yeah. signal a major reorientation mm -hmm. geopolitically uh, and economically mm -hmm. with the Middle, Middle East facing, uh, turning away from the U.S. That's right. And looking east. Yeah, yeah. Towards, uh, and it's not just China. I mean, this is ASEAN also. This is ASEAN. This is the Gulf countries, the Middle East. Um, but I mean, it's just, they're not, it's just not turning the back on the U.S., which is now a major competitor, yeah, yeah. but they're looking at, it's, everyone says, oh, they're looking directly at China, but it's China at the center of a massive now regional economy involving ASEAN. It's still Japan and South Korea are major, major players. That's right. Eurasia landmass. What, Eurasia and Central, um, Central, Central Asia. Asia. Yeah. yeah. So all of a sudden you start, I mean, Geopolitically, we always think the United States holds sway, mm -hmm. right? But now you increasingly see countries who are turning their orientation east mm -hmm. uh, instead of continuing to look mm -hmm. at things. Now they're looking over their shoulder at the U.S. The mm -hmm. U.S. cannot be ignored. But it, it's interesting how, how many of these things are happening. Talking of which, Cuba. Oh, the before vote. we get to Cuba. Okay. Just one other note about President Xi's anticipated visit to Saudi Arabia. Uh, according to the Saudi Foreign Ministry, he will visit Riyadh, of course. That's the capital. Jeddah, the commercial center, of course. But also the site of Neon City. The, oh, new, yeah, the city new city of the future. I mean, but that, isn't that more symbolic? Because this is the new Saudi Arabia that uh, uh, MBS, MBS is, is promoting. Pushing. Yeah. Yes. But the budget for that new city is anywhere between half to one trillion dollars. At least. Now, according to many analysts in the Middle East, who can be the only party that can help them build it? it there could be other parties, but there'd have to be a lot of them to equal what uh, China, China can, can do, do. And yeah. efficiently and That's cost right. effectively. That's right. Yeah. It's absolutely a massive project. It's already starting, mm -hmm. but... We'll have to see how that goes. I'm, I'm, I, I have to admit, I'm a bit skeptical. skeptical it's, yes. uh, it's not at the center of a trading area. It's a no. beautiful area, but it's basically in the desert yeah. uh, with a shoreline. Yeah. Um, so we'll have Hopefully. to see. Well, I mean, every country is, is trying to diversify itself mm -hmm. uh, and look to the future uh, when things are changing, if there is a future, assuming there is. But the attempt by Saudi Arabia to start moving into manufacturing is significant. But is, is it real? I mean, we talk yeah. about the uh, Europeans mm -hmm. having a problem with the cost of energy. Yeah. Right? Obviously, the cost of energy in Saudi very Arabia low. is very low. Yeah. But labor is another issue. That's it right. have to be imported. Okay. Now, what ideas they're now promoting or potentially can happen is automation. Even with automation, you still need a significant number of people who are maintaining... Sophisticated labor. Yes. Very sophisticated labor. Engineers. And yeah. For example, uh, Saudi Arabia just signed a deal with Foxconn mm -hmm. to 
create a new brand of electric vehicles. Um, yeah, but Terry Gu, who's yeah, head of Foxconn, yeah, yeah. I have experience with him in the state of Wisconsin. It, oh, Let yeah. us say that the promises are always much greater than the reality. Than the delivery, <laughs> yes. yeah. Uh, but I mean, the, uh, I'll tell you, just frankly, I, I look at it as very simple. Mm -hmm. uh, the cost of energy they can control. I mean, they mm -hmm. can get stuff out of the ground for about mm -hmm. you know, fifteen dollars a barrel. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly cheap, mm -hmm. and then the processing costs obviously they can do that. But then the cost of importing um, all of this la uh, the, the labor the, the things, mm -hmm. and I look at that as a trade-off. If mm -hmm. overall you're lower and you can be more competitive, fine, you, mm -hmm. you're in good position. Mm -hmm. Well, for, for Saudi Arabia, it's significant because it has a population of 35 million. Among the Gulf countries, is you know the most populated area. It's the size of the, yeah. a large Chinese city. Yeah. I, I'm just saying that on, yeah. on, in terms of economies of scale, it's difficult to see because the 35 million people we're talking about are not the ones who are going to be working in these factories, right. keeping these That's machines, right. the automation, the d data processing, all of these things. Uh, that are necessary. To the make joke this. is that they will actually hire Egyptians to do it. But, well, right. no, but that would be good regionally. Yeah. No problem there. Yeah. <clears throat> but the other issue is <clears throat> how do they compare to existing manufacturing areas like China? And the big difference that I see is that they could set up an automation line for almost anything. That's they right. have the money, uh, they have cheap energy, they can import from the region uh, workers, Components although that workers. always mm -hmm. has a political implication. Mm. You know, you look at the, the United States. Um, uh, immigration Europe, issues. Immigration issues came in, but they don't go away. That's right. <clears throat> so at this juncture, you have, you, you have them uh, trying to compete there, but mm -hmm. in the end, it's going to come down to these costs. That's right. And I don't see it. And the other thing is organization. In China, you have cluster developments. If I want to build a laptop, I can go to you know, areas where they have literally everything that I need. Within 20 miles. Yeah. Not even 20 miles. Well, I go out less, one yeah. door this way, one door that way, one door, you know, depending on which gate, <clears throat> I can get my motherboard, I can get my screens, I can get my injection plastic mm -hmm. molding, I can get uh, the camera. All the components are right there. Mm -hmm. That is not something that is easy to put together. That's... And even if it's automated, there still has to be design. Yeah. <clears throat> And I think design increasingly becomes an important part. Now, I, I do believe that the country that is going to do well from the next economy, the digital economy, is the one that prepares its people for it. Yeah. So I, I'd be more interested if they're talking about education uh, rather than just saying how I'm going to put a factory in the desert. <clears throat> Good luck to them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cuba. We, <clears throat> yeah, let's talk about Cuba. I, mean, for, I want to preface this. The, you know, the U.S. accuses China and Russia of obstructing the world order. I mean, to me, uh, this thing about Cuba is about the hypocrisy and lack of circumspection. Mm -hmm. It is astounding. You have a vote, 185 to two. To two. <laughs> U.S. and Israel. Yeah. All right. Against, you know, it's just say like stop with these 19, you know, 1959 they imposed these sanctions on Cuba. Well, if it was going to work, let's pretend that the time has elapsed. We're way beyond the period where mm -hmm. you can say that mm -hmm. sanctions mm -hmm. have changed it. Yes, you've made um, their economy slower. That's right. Uh, you certainly have uh, made people there suffer. That's right. right. But it hasn't changed anything. In fact, the sanctions themselves have contributed to the longevity of the existing government because everyone rallies around this idea that we do not want our policy made in another capital. That's right. And so this is despite so many attempts at regime change as well. Yes. By oh, the US. Uh, uh, <laughs> they cataloged how many hundreds of attempts That's to right. assassinate. That's right, assassinate Castro. Well, but it, yeah. it, makes, it makes the US intelligence service look a little bit Yeah. Uh, impotent. Incompetent. Impotent, uh, impotent yeah. incompetent, you yeah. can yeah. fill in whatever word you want. There are two sides to, there are two aspects to this. One is, as you described, 185 to 2, 
U.S. and Israel on one side, the rest of the world, including the Europeans on the other side. Yeah, but right? where's the international world order? Where's That's the right. rule of law? That's where, right. where, where's this multilateralism, I, multipolarity? I, I remember, you know, in this, in this context, I remember very well, after the country, many countries became independent in the 1950s and 60s, uh, there were two major movements. One is the movement of the non-aligned. In other mm -hmm. words, we're not with the Russia, the Soviet side, and we're not with the American side. Why do we have to choose? Exactly. Why do we have to choose? And that's one side on the political side. And it was coming. It came from the Bandung Conference in Indonesia, the movement of the non-aligned, uh, strongly supported by, or promoted by India and Indonesia and Algeria and so on. And then you have the other one, which is the Group of 77, which is the developing countries on the economic side in demanding uh, the former colonial powers to stop the exploitation and plunder of the developing countries. Well, you should know this well since yeah. you were the second secretary. Yeah. You were secretary of the second group, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I was secretary of the G77 <clears throat> for about five years. Um, but on the political side, I think um, it's become so patently clear that what the U.S. mouths has nothing to do with their actions in reality. Um, there's a little history to this. I don't think most people, most, most of the audience would not, would probably not know. The reason why the sanctions were imposed is because the argument was the Soviet Union was putting missiles in Cuba. Too close to the US, nuclear missiles, nuclear bombs, very dangerous. But very few, very few people knew because main, mainstream media doesn't cover it, is that the Soviet Union put it there because the Americans put it in Turkey. Put it in Turkey. <clears throat> yeah. The Americans started by wanting to put nuclear missiles. Yes, but whenever America wants to put missiles on your border, yeah. right, that is an expression of uh, you know, sovereignty. Yeah. Of the good guys working with other good guys. Righteously so. Yeah, but if, <laughs> if Russia does it, it's the bad guys. And yeah. if you associate with Russia, you're bad guys. That's right. But the Cuban Missile Crisis, 63, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. came and went. Why did the sanctions stay? That's right. That's right. Why? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I guess there's 185 other countries who don't know either. That's right. 185 I mean, countries who don't agree. Yeah. yeah. But the, the, the constant criticism of, by the U.S. Uh, that uh, there are powers within the U.N. who are obstructing, obstructing the will of the majority. I think this the majority of 185 to two. <laughs> well, there hasn't been any any deals where there's been 185 That's to right. two involving right. uh, any other nation yeah. out there. Uh, well, the relationship between Cuba and many South American, Latin American countries have actually been quite good. Yeah, and it's getting better. Well, when he held the. Um, the summit of the Americas. Uh -huh. People said we're not coming because you're not in inviting the Cuba and Venezuela. Well, no, not only then. I mean, they, yeah. they, uh, there was uh, a, a number of Venezuela, etc. So, what they said is, is if you're, if it's a real summit of Americas, that means all of the Americas, not just the Americans, Americans uh, that you like. Yeah, uh, this is not that way. No. But you know, let's let's uh, <clears throat> the the other counterpoint to this is. All of a sudden, uh, uh, Blinken came out with a statement that the key to solving um, you know, this, this issue to stop the nuclear uh, DPRK uh -huh. and North uh, uh -huh. Korea from exploding a nuclear bomb or sending off more missiles uh -huh. was Russia and China. Okay, so I'm, I, I try to understand this. Um, the two countries that you say are irresponsible warmongers or uh, technological... Promoters of the, Yeah, just the bad actors. Yeah. Whenever you have a problem, the U.S. Mm -hmm. has a problem, they can't solve. They blame want, somebody else. Well, it's not blame somebody else. You're asking the people you vilify mm -hmm. on a daily basis to be the responsible stakeholders to take care of the situation. I, I don't understand it. If I think you're really terrible, why would I ask you to do the right thing? <laughs> That's right. Including, it's not just DPRK. Oh, everything. Also the Ukrainian war. 
Sure. Right? Yeah. China has to stop it. That's right. How? How, exactly. So they, they haven't supported it, so how are they supposed to stop it? In terms of TPRK, um, however you look at it, there are American troops 10,000 miles away from their borders. On right the border. On the border of DPRK, you know? Yeah, I mean, but DPRK is, is no angel. I mean, it's they're not, clearly he's signaling he wants attention. He needs um, help. Well, I the mean, economy. He's, he, he, 2022 will be a record breaker in terms of the number of missiles that have been sent. Yeah. You have um, missiles now that are landing, you know, 60 miles off the off the coast of uh, South Korea. They're mm -hmm. being flown over Japan. Japan. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know that ratcheting up uh, the tensions by putting nuclear B1, uh, B1 bomber, B. Yes. Yeah, B1B bombers um, on the border That's is right. the way of calming down the situation. <laughs> and I don't understand that this military response, what you need is a diplomatic response. Mm -hmm. Um, I can under, you know, <clears throat> there should be statements uh, where they try to get the six party talks back together and say, look, you know, you're not going to get anything mm -hmm. until uh, you um, stop, stop with this. There's got to be some way to lift sanctions mm -hmm. partially mm -hmm. to show that there's some goodwill. But North Korea has to agree to stop its side. Yeah. But until you get to that level of trust, yeah. putting more... B putting more military hardware on the line hasn't worked so far. That's right. So um, in this context, this is a different subject, but it's tied into this nuclear thing, is what uh, Schultz said upon return to Germany, to the press. He said, the trip was worth it, even if it's just for one thing yeah. that we've managed to achieve. Germany and China agrees that there should be no use of nuclear weapons or the threat of use of nuclear, nuclear weapons. weapons. And China has been very clear. There were right. position papers put yeah. out that said that China will not be the in first. any way, yeah. well, no, not only be the first, but will not agree to anybody, mm -hmm. any country, mm -hmm. using the threat or actual nuclear weapons. And yeah. that is a bright red line. That's right. right. Yeah. And that's very, very significant because it may be addressed to Moscow, but it's certainly also addressed to Washington. Yeah, it's, it's addressed to Washington, but it, it's, really, it's really talking about uh, the global strategic initiatives mm -hmm. that uh, she is putting out there. And it says, we have to security initiatives. You have to have a basis by which we can all talk and agree. A right. nuclear war has to be one of the bedrock issues that's, right. that's, that's right. out there. So he's not only speaking for China, he's, or in Germany. This really is a statement to the rest of the world about That's where right. China stands vis-a-vis yeah. -vis this. Nuclear non-proliferation. Well, yeah. there, there was a statement by uh, uh, somebody very close to the State Department that said that uh, nuclear, use of nuclear weapons could be justified, not on a first uh, responding to mm -hmm. a first strike, but as a, uh, ans as a answer to strategic interests being things. I mean, how could you have two more stark statements? The U.S. hinting that we can use nuclear weapons if we think we have to, mm -hmm. um, and China saying it's, it's impossible. That's there right. should never be a threat. That's so right. That, I agree with you. Yeah. I'll also address the U.S. That's very, very, very significant statement, I think. Mm. And for, for Germany, for Schultz to say that if it, this is the only thing I got, the trip was worth it. You know? Well, I think the $27 billion deals. Yeah, that also well, makes a difference, yeah, sure. Well, you know, interesting. He got to the honeypot first, apparently. Yeah, that's right. <laughs>